constantly be innovative and allotting time to education, which is something we carry into the company today. Like make sure you're dedicating 30 minutes a week to learning something new. Try and have a lot of open and honest conversations with my team. So today my guest was Lauren Loretto. She is from Florida and I've got introduced to her by a really good friend of mine named Ari Hicks. So talking to Lauren today, we talked about all the different things that she's done from moving multiple times, her dad climbing the corporate ladder and how he was an extremely important instrumental mentor in her life in that regard. How she worked numerous hours at an agency and how she just said, screw you guys, I'm gonna start my own thing. And transitioning to that and how she got her first client and how that was really just a happenstance thing, but it's propelled her to a very successful business, also her dealings with motherhood, her short-term rental business, and also her podcast. So you will love my conversation with Lauren Loretto. Lauren, thank you so much for being here today. She came up all the way from Fort Myers just to sit here with me for this hour, not really. So um, <laughs> Lauren and I have a mutual friend, Ari Hicks, who has been on one of our previous episodes. You gotta go check that one out, because Ari's absolutely brilliant. And that's how I got to know Lauren. And then we've had a little bit of contact from afar and then, hey, she's coming to town, let's do this. And so I'm so glad to have you. I know, as soon as I knew I was coming here, I was like, Thomas. Yes. <laughs> you wanna sit down? Yeah, I do. So, okay, the first thing I like to always do is just give me the background of who you are. You're in the marketing world. That's all great and that's all dang. That could be 47 different topics. So tell me about you, like, where are you from? But off camera, we talked about how you moved around a bunch. Yeah. Give me the back. Give me your background. It's it's such a when people ask me that question. Actually, Ari's husband asked me that last night. I was like, but it's very complicated because yeah. I was born in California, but okay. I don't even register that. Like we lived there six weeks. Okay. Moved to Minnesota for a year. Don't register that because I was like, you I know, remember. one. Yeah. Um. But so I identify as a Texan because I grew up from like one to ten in Dallas, Texas. Right. And okay. my entire family, like a lot of my family and extended family is still there all over Texas. When I go back to Texas, that's what feels like, you know, the nostalgia sure. of your childhood. Yeah. But at nine, we moved to Florida. Okay. Okay. So left the whole family unit. Like this was the first time. Like, and most sides of my family are huge. Like, my dad has yeah. four siblings. My mom has five siblings. I grew up around my cousins. Like, sure. And so we, we relocated to Florida. And that's, you're probably gonna ask why. Yeah. So my dad climbed the corporate industry, the corporate, um, ladder corporate ladder in the restaurant industry perfect yeah yeah so he started with container store he worked container store for seven years 17 really years cool. oh yeah so this guy can okay. like do a bow and a display like yeah. nothing other but he transitioned into the into the restaurant industry so he was working for dave why? masters why okay why because like most of the time that's a passion play of like i'm a heck of a cook i can bake good yeah and then i want to go do my own thing but this guy's in the corporate world and transitions yeah. to restaurants. Tell me what, what was the reason there? So he um, he went to school for architecture, Texas Tech. Okay. And so, um, but I think, yeah, I mean, culturally speaking, my dad lived in France. I think he lived in Australia. Like he's lived all over and he loves food. Like that family is so centric around food. Huh. And so I think the transition into the restaurant industry just made sense for him. Okay. And it, was, it wasn't just any restaurant, it was Dave and Buster's. Yeah. Which is arcade, gaming, sure. whatever, but then like adult the Chuck burger. E. Cheese. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's the adult Chuck E. Cheese. Yes, it is. Oh my gosh. We had the best birthday parties yeah, as a kid. Like, I bet. We did not go to Chuck E. Yeah, Cheese. Like exactly. me and my friends went to right. Dave and Buster's. Sure. And so, yeah, so it would just made sense. And so he really started like building his resume, background, everything there. And that really set the stage for me. Like we could talk about that yeah. for just like my dad's passion and drive and just like knowing his employees and the things they said about him, like as a leader, as a worker, like my dad had, was a really great example for me growing up. So we moved to Florida. Yeah. That was with Hard Rock. I'm like, okay, dad, you couldn't get any cooler. Okay, so how do you, how do you now? I'm 30. No, 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 when you moved to Hard Rock, when okay. you moved to Florida. Oh, nine? how old? Oh yes, nine. Okay, so let me, let me stop you here. How much, so it sounds like he worked a ton. How much was he yeah. involved, good or bad, how much was he involved in extremely pivotal years of your life, zero to nine? Yeah, it's it, that's hard to answer. I remember him traveling a lot, but I okay. also remember him being there a lot. Like really? my dad was, he helped with bath time. Like, yeah, and dad was around and we had fun and we hung up Christmas lights every year and we cooked a lot and yeah. we partied a lot. Sure. Like, I remember that. What yeah. about mom? Tell me about mom. Mom quit working when my sister was born. I was like five or six. Okay. 
And so then she stayed home. And like, obviously those are pivotal years. That's what you remember. Right. So my mom was pretty much stay at home mom. Yeah. Um, with us and, you know, carting us everywhere and doing sure. everything. All right. So you moved to Florida. Dad's working at Hard Rock. Hard Rock. You go from really, really cool kid to extremely cool kid. Oh, yeah. dad runs Hard Rock. Because Hard Rock HQ is also like had a foosball table and a fountain and a soda fountain. Oh, my gosh. You know, yes. so like, and, oh, and not to mention the vault. Okay. And nine years old. All right. In sync. Britney yes. Spears. Like this was, that was my, oh, that was no. like my childhood. So your dad was in the middle of all that. Yes. He is like meeting Steven Tyler, like he. So at at the Hard Rock headquarters in Orlando, they have the memorabilia warehouse. Yeah. So if you go to any Hard Rock around the world, like there's memorabilia everywhere. Sure. But they they start to collect that, and they have places for that for when they open new concepts or they need to switch out memorabilia or Correct. whatever. So like I have pictures of wearing like Elton Glon, Elton John glasses and like Lance Bass's vest, like thinking I'm just the coolest kid Man. in the world. Yeah. Oh my God. It was like. It was so cool. So y'all moved so there. How long did he, was he with Hard Rock? No, no, let's talk. He's like, Hard Rock Cafe is a restaurant, but what was he doing? He wasn't back in the back cooking. What was he doing in the in the corporate yeah. office? Yeah. So my dad's titles have all floated around like senior director of facilities, director of facilities. So he's the guy you call if like a restaurant's burning down or like sure. something's not working or they're installing new flooring or whatever. Like baseline design construction facilities for okay. restaurants. So how, how long is he with them? He was with them three years. Okay. But then he, came, he went back eventually. Okay. <clears throat> so then, then we got relocated to Georgia. Now this was right before the recession. So like, housing boom. Six oh oh five oh six oh seven. Yeah. Okay. So he got relocated up there for a restaurant group called Rare Hospitality, and they okay. owned Capital Grill and Longhorn. Rare Hospitality. Yeah. I've heard of them. They're okay. a big company. They were. <laughs> they were a big company. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So then we were in Georgia for them. Were, were you in Atlanta? Where were you at? Yes, I was in. We were in like Alpharetta, which yeah. then turned into Johns Creek. Exactly. So. No exactly where it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I loved it, and we like that's that was it. We were like, we're here. We're like, yeah. my it. mom is like, I'm done. I'm done moving the kids and the family. Like we like let's settle. Yeah. That's not the reality of the corporate yeah. restaurant industry world, mm -hmm. but we were there, and um, things were great. But then the recession hit. Mm. And it was like, oh, okay, um, this is serious. And Darden Restaurants, okay. which is like Olive Garden, Red Lobster, yeah. you've probably heard of yeah. all the concepts, dangled a carrot in front of the CEO of Rare and he took it. And so the only option we had was to move to Florida where, back to Orlando, where Darden's headquartered. So y'all got absorbed? Got absorbed, yeah. So there was, and, and you know, this was a time where like my dad was getting job offers left and right. Like I remember one thing I learned from my mom is like, don't talk about things before they happen. Sure. <laughs> because my mom would come to us all the time and be like, we're going to move to Scottsdale. We're going to move to here. here, here. Cause my dad was getting job offers left and right. And like, like mom, wait, like wait to tell yeah, us yeah. until like until it's, it's set in stone. Yeah. Um, so that was just, that's my dad's life. Like even to this day, my, I feel like he gets offers left and right. Really? To go place. Yeah. Cause he's an incredibly hard worker, has a great reputation in the industry and he's done really great sure. things. He's a knowledge bomb. So, um, but during the recession, like no one was hiring. So during the recession, you talk, well, how were you during that time? So you're 30, so 13, yeah, 13. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, 14. You, you, so you remember that though. You remember, remember. that. Okay. Yeah. I remember how, I remember like having a hard Christmas, you know, really? like I remember that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you're not even in high school yet. You guys moved back to Florida. Mm -hmm. He works for the Darden group. How long do you work for them? So yeah. So he came back to Florida. And I think this I, is a lot. I know it's a lot. That's what I'm saying. Like this is my dad's jumped around a lot, but he was there for a couple more years <clears> and, but they've stayed there. They've stayed like they've oh, been they're in there Orlando. Now. Okay. <clears> was that what did I end up being home high school and all that stuff? I finished high school there. Okay. So I think we moved back to Florida at the end of my freshman year. Okay. And let me tell you how hard it is to pull a kid out of a place. She's lived, go to a place where she starts to thrive, mm -hmm. bring her back to a place she's already lived before. And like, it, that was weird to me because I've yeah. been used to moving so much to new places and now I'm back in a place where I knew people. So you moved to the same place. We, yeah, it was a very similar area. Like there were kids in my high school that like I went to middle school with. Gotcha. And it, when you thrust a teenage girl into sophomore year mm -hmm. at a high public high school, like that was probably the toughest year of my life. Really? <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Just because you were the new girl but not the new girl or like what's wrong with this yeah. girl type thing? Yeah, and, and I mean just, identity crisis of worlds, you sure. know, like Alpharetta versus Orlando, like, you know, clicks and different things. I mean, and it was, it was even hard. So I was, when we lived in Florida the first time, we moved to Georgia. Okay. This was at a time when like 
if you lived in Florida, you wore Etnies and Roxy and you had the puka shells yeah. and like moved to Georgia and I'm getting made fun of in the seventh grade because I'm wearing those things and all the other girls are wearing Vera Bradley, Dooney and Burke, like. Totally different culture. Preppy. So I was there, yeah. I was in that area, I want to say in that time frame because I lived in Atlanta in O, two, no, a little bit before that, I guess O, O three, O four. Okay. So I was in that, but I recruited that area from O seven to thir to twelve. So I was in that area a bunch. And okay. You're right. It the was a Alpharetta Johns Creek is high income. Yeah. Not very much low income at all. Very preppy. Wasp. White Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, just, yeah. it's very, and Orlando is like a melting pot of people. It's a melting pot because it's also a very traveler heavy sure. area. I hate the word tourist. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> tourist. Right We're going to call them travelers. Okay. So growing up, you moved mm -hmm. all these different places. You saw all the different things. You, all the different cultures from, I mean, Minnesota, Texas, Florida, Georgia, back to Florida. When someone would ask you, Hey, Lauren, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> what did you say? But this is like one of my favorite questions. Um, I wasn't sure. Okay. So, so I think I like grappled with art director. So in, in high school, I ended up doing yearbook and like leading yearbook and being editor in chief and doing that. Okay. And like we had an award winning yearbook. So like it was kind of a big deal. Yeah. So I saw like an art director. And what's funny is I always tell people this this way. So because of my dad yeah. climbing the corporate ladder, sure. right? So you have the ladder in your head. Mm -hmm. I would always say I never saw the middle rungs. I saw like starting somewhere and then like leading. I okay. I couldn't fathom and you know, at 18 years old, how could you? But I just didn't see it. And I don't, like, I mean, probably because I walked into my dad being so successful, like that's what I saw. I didn't really have an example for like how you work your way up or <clears throat> know that what that could look like for myself. Yeah. So I struggled and uh, I was that kid who my mom was always like, she struggles with authority and like she's no, always in trouble. She's she defiant. She wants to be her own boss. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and yeah. So that's like, I, I never really had an answer because I was like, I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't want to be confined by someone telling me what to do. So I hate the word entrepreneur. I like rather the, rather the word business owner. So I wouldn't consider your dad a business owner, but there's so many maverick type moves going on here. Mm -hmm. Gonna go here and do this thing. Gonna go here and make a little more money and do this thing. Like entrepreneurial. I think so. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. where do you think that thought came from? Where, where do you think you got not seeing the middle rung? I don't know. I, I don't know. I like, yeah. like that's like the biggest question. Maybe I'll maybe I'll ask my therapist. <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, Perfect. why didn't I see like video it? I'm just, kidding. <laughs> I'm just messing. With you. Yeah. Um, can you tell me? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. I I don't know. I just I just didn't. And so you know, not to jump ahead, but like when I did join the corporate world, I struggled. Yeah. Struggled. Like, and that's what your dad thrived in. Yeah. That's it was yeah. like, I'm so, like identity crisis. So many ways sure. around. Yeah. <laughs> so, so going to high school, miss your book, um, the things creative, what did you do after high school? So I moved down to South Florida. So I was living okay. in Orlando. I had this mentality of like, I'm in Florida. There's no excuse to not go to school on the beach. Okay, great. Okay, Perfect. that great. That's yeah. like the majority of the colleges in yeah. Florida. And I didn't, I also didn't want to go to a prestigious state school. I knew that. I was like, I don't want to go to UF. Don't want to go to FSU. I don't even think I'd get in. Yeah. Um, I dual enrolled in high school. So yeah, I was sure. like, and, and I think that's also part of the complex mm -hmm. of like not wanting to follow the, the norm. Yeah. I loved like, not having to be at school for half the day and then going to a college campus and like nice. being a grown up, yeah, you know? Sure. Um, so I chose FAU because it was cheap. Florida Atlantic for everybody. For, yes. Yeah. Okay. Florida Atlantic University yeah. is in Boca. Yeah. I was like, okay, this is wedged between some like super affluent areas. You got West Palm, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, all booming developments at the time. It's 2011. Yep. And um, then Miami Gardens. <clears throat> and then Miami Gardens. I mean, listen, yeah. <laughs> We just moved out of Fort Lauderdale, so like yeah. it's just it's just looking back, it's so wild, like what's come there. But at the time, no one really knew what Fort Lauderdale was. Sure. They were like, "Oh, where's that?" And it's like, "Oh, it's between West Palm and Miami." Now, like, it's, it's as big as Miami. Yeah, no doubt. But anyway, so I was like, "Okay, there's no excuse to not yeah. go somewhere where I think it could kickstart my career in some way and be cheap and easy to get into." Yeah. I also, <laughs> 18 years old, was like. I'm not going to be on the Dean's list. Like that's not my MO. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to get a part-time job. I'm going to intern as soon as I can yeah. and figure out what the heck I want to do. But why did you go to college then? If you like this, so college is like just a, I think that college is great and terrible in so many ways. 
I think the college is a great bridge to the next stage. Yeah. Okay. But, but I didn't have to pay for college. Right. At all. At all. Like I left college with money in the bank. So for me and for anyone else out there that has to take out Buku's of debt to go travel that bridge, it's almost like it's not worth it. So like you, you had no thought of education or what all that other stuff you had thought of growing up so why did you go to college uh, that's, yeah that's a really good question so i was fortunate that my parents did pay for my school yeah so i also walked out with not i walked out with credit card debt because i tried to do a reverse retirement and like travel you know what i mean Perfect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> again again this yeah. you're getting a feel for yeah i've um, never heard it called reverse retirement that's great <laughs> yeah um I had a tough last few years in high school because, again, like, I don't know if you're catching any themes here, but, like, I really struggled with people, anyone telling me what to do, even my parents. Um, and I wanted, I wanted, I craved independence from the moment I was, like, 16. Wow. Okay. So I got in with a bad boyfriend. Yeah. Um, you know, my parents didn't like him and there was some, like, there were some issues there. Sure. And I was just, I was dying to get out and I knew, like, my parents wanted me to go to school. But I don't think I, I, I also thought differently. I thought I'm going to go to college because that's what you do. I'm going to get an education because that's mm. what you do. And not to, you know, insult my parents for wanting that path for me, too. But I looked at college as life experience, not like I looked sure. at it as like, I'm going to go here and this is going to teach me how to juggle 500 things. Yep. This is going to teach me how to, you know, if I want a social life, like how, how am I going to make it all happen? That's also why I was like, yeah. I'm not going to go and be on the Dean's list. Gotcha. So I knew it was going to be four years of testing my future, like figuring out what I want. And honestly, that's a very, very forethought because a lot of, not a lot of 18 year olds think I'm going to go do this to juggle my life and learn. I mean, cause what you just told me, I'm going to go learn responsibility. Yeah, basically. And you said that and you were thinking that it sounds like. So you go, did you get a degree? I did get a degree. What did you do? So here's the, the <laughs> college part. So did you like raise like lots of hell or were you like a pretty good normal student or did you <laughs> just, just, you know, do your job, have a bunch of different jobs. Tell me about the, the whole experience there. Mm hmm. Yeah. I partied a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Freshman year. I got it out of my system. Okay. I, like most of people, like most people do. Yeah, I, my grades weren't great, but I passed. There you go, better than and, most. Yeah, but okay, but here's the other thing: like you gotta hack the system, dude. So like, yeah, you have to know that your first year's electives, and you can you can bomb your electives. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's it's well for me it was because I had my core classes done because I dual enrolled. Absolutely, and a lot so, of people don't do that. And well, no, I say that yeah. a lot of people are doing it now. They should. Yeah. It's so brilliant. I mean, the school pay, the, the, the state pays for your textbooks. Like that's, I mean, it's just, that makes sense. you got to do it. Yeah. And so I knew that going in. So I knew truly I could be out in three years, but no, my parents, absolutely. My parents were like, now nah, take the four. And I'm yeah. like, great. I get to figure things out this first sure. year. So it was a lot of like, I did like astronomy and art history and stuff like that. That first year thinking I wanted to major in graphic design and minor in communications. Long story short, I failed my BFA in my junior year, okay. which is like you do this whole submission with artwork. I can't draw. Yeah, sure. I'm like figure drawing. Yeah. No, I failed. So I, I flipped. I was able to flip it and like you know major minor the other direction. But yeah, freshman year was a flop. Okay. Partied a lot. So, so talking about transitioning to college, if you had a senior in high school and they knew they were going to go to college, what is the number one thing? you would tell them to do? Just do the dual enrollment. Why? I think a lot of seniors look at their last years like, I'm gonna have fun, my grades yeah. are set in stone, I, like, I'm gonna get into school if they're good, if that's what I wanna do. But if you dual enroll, you knock off a ton of the basic, like English one, English two, Spanish, sure. whatever, off your plate so that you can get into school and now start playing with electives and figuring out what you wanna do. Figuring out what you wanna do is yeah. probably the most important thing. Correct. That's I mean, great. You cannot expect most 18 year olds to know that. No. And I think the biggest way to like, just get that out of the way and, and start to just play and try yeah. is that because your freshman year, you're likely not interning. No, no, I agree with that. And most, and this is, this is the crazy job market we're in now. We just hired an intern last semester and we had probably over 50 applicants for interns. Most of these kids were either seniors or just about to graduate and pooping their pants saying yeah. mostly jobs I'm applying to for entry level want four years experience, four oh, yeah. years experience. Sure. 
how do you get that if you don't start interning by your sophomore year which is what i did and like i just did it because i was trying to figure out what i want but now that's like you that's the standard like you have to be doing that I t so we've got a girl that's intern i don't like interns because about the time you get an intern coached up they leave yeah but i tell them this to me there's two things an intern is a long job interview mm -hmm. i'm never going to hire somebody for a position that i don't think i could possibly feel in six months eight months whatever that's number one and number two i always look at them and say hey look here's the goal of this whole time period number one figure out if you like this industry and you like what you want to do number two do you like me yeah if you don't like this industry this is a win if you don't like me and you like this industry and you want to go work for somebody else that's a win too so figuring out what you want to do is the most important thing money aside like Honestly, making money at internships is not really a big deal. No, you can't. Figuring yeah. out the goods and the bads of the wedding planning industry, the marketing industry, the restaurant industry, whatever. Like my niece, she's a sophomore in college. She's had an interview at Brick and Tin, which is a cool restaurant here in Birmingham. She's like, hey, what do I need to tell them? I'm like, you're willing to do anything you want to do, anything they have you to do to learn everything you can learn. Because if you do that, you can set yourself up for quicker success when you're ready for that. Because right now they're not ready for that. Right. So interns. So you started interning sophomore year. Sophomore year. We're doing what? What were you doing? I was working for someone. Man, hindsight's crazy. Yeah. Uh, it was a sports agency, extreme sports agency. Right. That's cool. It was awesome. It was awesome. We, I mean, like, um, have you seen? Oh, I can't even remember what it's called. It's on Netflix. It came out maybe like six months ago, but it's about like free diving. Have you seen that one yet? No. Y'all go watch it. It's so cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the guy dies. There's a guy that, they, yeah. Yeah, it's I really remember, sad. I remember seeing the, the, the trailer. There's an. British guy, Australian guy, William Truebridge, who did some commentary in that. Oh. He was one of our clients. No way. Yeah, so he he do dove like deep blue down in um like the, he lived in Long Island, Bahamas, and so he was one. We had some MMA fighters, and so I basically like helped them with their website, social, like really bootstrapping a lot of their early stage marketing so they could get more. This clients. is uh, how many years ago? Ten years. Eight years 2013. ago. Two thousand thirteen. Okay, so I right at ten years ago. Yeah. That's really cool. So how so you entered? What else did you intern? I interned at an aftermarket Tesla accessory company. Okay. When they were like the monopoly of, yeah. of, of that. So that gave me a lot, like a big taste into e com. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of startup. Sports agency, then e com, then what? Marketing. Okay. Where, would you, where did you do the it was, marketing? It was just like a, a very small agency. Okay. Of those three, which one did you like the most? Like liked or, I mean, I, mean, I was most challenged by the e com. That was okay. really interesting. It was a lot of customer service. It taught me a lot about, sure. and I feel like that's really important, especially as an entrepreneur, yeah. knowing how to talk to people. Mm. Um, but the marketing agency is where I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. Okay, let me ask you a question. Do you think it's what you wanted to do because you did it your, with your fourth year of college? Or do you think you did, it's what you want to do because you liked it the most? Because at 18 or 19, you're not really developed mentally. No. So do you think that was skewed, or do you think that like, really is the thing? I knew I didn't want to work client side, if that tells you anything. Okay. It, it right. gave me the intel of like one project yeah. versus or one product, one client versus like getting to touch about a bunch of different industries all at the same time. Okay. Explain that. So probably people won't know what that means. It you said it made me know that I didn't want to be client side. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Client side is like you're focused on one mission, one vision, one trajectory pretty much. So like, let's say, you know, you go work if you're working here, if you're working for a church mm -hmm. or something like that. Like that's your focus. You're you're tied into their mission. You're driving their mission, and there may be like some entrepreneurial opportunities, like mm -hmm. working across different departments or touching different things. But you're not like you're not varying what you're touching. Sure. So so you go from working in this marketing company, then what? Then I got a job at an agency. A marketing agency. Yeah, an advertising firm agency. Okay. How yeah. long did you work there? Um, one year, seven months. Was did you like it? No, one year, two months. Did you like it? No. Okay. <laughs> but you left there and did what? Uh, I started my company. I started my company while I worked at that company. So you, I was you 23. Work, nice. you're working at a firm, marketing agency. You didn't like working there. So you went and started your own deal. Yeah. That so is so like, that is the thing right now. So whether you're a plumber, whether you're in marketing, whether you're, in HVAC or I can't tell you how many stories in the last I mean two months that I've talked to people that I worked for so and so and it sucked and I went and started my own deal and I make a gazillion dollars because you think you can do it better you think you can do it better yeah I, I heard a, um, a plumbing guy did the same thing yeah I got screwed by his boss 
boss was a turd, whatever. He went and started his own thing. He's killing it. Sometimes so, it's so simple. So why, why, what did, okay, so here's a, a great question. What did you not, and you can be, I want you to be as extremely op- open and honest. What did you not like about working at that marketing agency? Yeah, so it, they, their clients were mostly retail focused. So I was working on clients like Party City, Michael's Crafts, and they burn you into the ground. They literally have a sign at the, in the main city hall. It says, welcome to the machine. When, okay, they, they literally <laughs> burn you in the ground. What does that mean? Give me an example. Give me, like a, give me a snapshot of what that means. Okay, so you're there at 8 a.m. Don't you dare leave at 5. Mm. Don't you dare be watching the clock and leave Garden at 5. Guard your desk. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, so I worked in the social acquisition room. And it was kind of a fish tank. So there's like all these glass walls, like kind of like this here. Yeah. And it was the focal point of the agency. So that anytime they did agency tours, like you had to have your desk filled. If you were in a meeting, that meeting doesn't really matter. Like you need to be in your desk. Or so you need to go get someone from another department and have them fill your spot. If you're going to go anywhere on the weekend, you better have your laptop with you. I took my laptop on the freaking boat. Wow. Just in case I needed to tether to my phone and yeah. like turn on a campaign. Just They just expect you to work absolutely all the time all the time and where i in the department i worked in and so funny because my boss now is actually like one of my good friends but back then i hated her and it felt like it felt like the mean girls group and i didn't fit in Mm. it was very clicky yeah it was just it was a grind and so you know if we're talking about like mindset right i'm like 21 20 no 22 22 about to be 23 i'm like you know what i think this is like teaching me a lot i think i you know i definitely want to run my own business I have people and friends coming to me asking me to make a logo, run their social. Like they know what I do and they just think that that expertise can be applied to them and and maybe it can. Um, So maybe I'm just going to look at this as paid education. Absolutely. And I saw other people starting to do the same. Like I remember being so envious the day that like one of my, she wasn't necessarily my boss, but she was in between me and my boss. She left and started a, a marketing consulting company with her twin sister. Good for her. Yeah. And, and how I, long after that did you leave? Shortly after. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she had the balls after. to do it, so I'm going to do it now. Well, I got this $100 handshake basically from, you know, my my husband, then boyfriend at the time. I We just started dating and I was having like, we were having the time of our lives. I was on the boat all the time. Yeah. We're like going to the Bahamas and fishing and just living the life. And he went to Naval Architecture School and a lot of his friends like moved down to Florida to, I mean, that's where you go if you work in boating. Okay. Okay. So a few of his friends worked at Contender Boats. Okay. And we go down to visit one of the friends and the, one of the guys is the marketing director at Contender Boats. And I'm 23. Like I'm not, I'm yeah. like, I'm like, I'm here to have fun. Let's go sure. drink. Like I want to get on the boat. AJ's like, Hey, Jordan right here. He's, he's the director of marketing at Contender. I'm like, okay. It's like, yeah, they haven't posted on social media in like six months. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, they haven't. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> oh, and I was like, hey, Jordan. Like, that's so funny. I do social media marketing. Okay, they're still our client today. No, yeah. 10 years later. Yeah. Well, uh, like seven years now. later, eight years later. Seven, eight, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. And, and, um, so who was your first client? That was our, that was it. That was my break. So I remember sitting like on my lunch break. You're like, not, in okay, the other have room. you started your, have you started your company yet? I had an LLC because I was, but you were I was still freelancing. Working there. I was still working there. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And so I was. I will tell people this to the day I die: don't quit a job until you have something else going and running. No, that's the best piece of advice I've ever received as well. Because, yeah. like, when we were doing meal fit, I was working in the church, and I wasn't making anything. I was making twenty grand because I was part time. But I'd started making a little money doing the meal plan thing, and I had gotten to the point where my where what I made was quadruple what I was bringing. Now, granted, I was bringing home $20,000 a year because I was part-time, but I, let's just call it 40. So I was making double what I would have normally made. I was made about 80 that year doing the meal plan thing. And I tell people, like I had a buddy, a guy sucker made $200,000 a year and he quit. I'm like, hey dude, what are you gonna do? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, are you crazy? Do you have cash reserves? No doubt. <laughs> so I tell people this all the time. If you got something, you hate your job, you got something you want to go, go find and start doing that thing because you'll learn a lot doing that thing. And then also, you, it's not a safety net. And you hear people say all the time, you know, burn the ships. I'm not going back. No, don't. No, think practically. You got to pay your freaking bills. Mm-hmm. Because if you've got some financial uh, security, you can be more adventurous, you can be more creative, and you don't have to make the thing right. now. You don't have to sell your soul. Right. 
And it sounds like that's what you, that's what I did. It sounds like what you did. So how many clients did you have before you left the agency? <sighs> yeah. So I guess I'll elaborate a bit more. I had them. I did take a part-time client side job to build that. What do you mean? So I ended up working for a company called BPI Sports. Have you heard of them? Mm -mm. They, they're a supplement company. They do like, uh, they, they sponsor a lot of like Olympia athletes. Okay. Yeah, BPI. it's up there with like Optimum, yeah, Optimum Nutrition. Okay, like all yeah, of them, yeah. it's up all there. Right. So I, I, I did that. I, I slowly transitioned. It took about one to two years to like fully make the jump. Sure. And by the time I did, we had five, like five retainer clients. And I, we were starting to take on like more project work for web design and development. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it, it took time. It wasn't something I was confident in jumping at 23 years old. I, yeah. I think it was 25, 26 by the time it was like. What skills did you develop in those that year and seven months? <laughs> at the agency? Yeah. Oh man, I learned how to communicate, how to like how to write an email. Honestly, I feel like that's like a huge one is like how to structure an email and not treat it like a text message. Be professional because they're going to you're going to have sliding scales of expectations, especially if you're like I'm, I, we do founder led sales like I yeah. lead all sales and people have different corporate backgrounds and experiences yeah. and like the way you talk in an email, like there's just etiquette there. I'm not very good at that. Ari will tell you. <laughs> so go ahead. No, email, how to write an email. email etiquette is huge. Um, how to like and how to be professional in responding and communicating communication like hands down how to make sure that you are ahead of the client at all times it was like a major slap on the wrist if a client ever emailed us with a trend or something that we should be responsible with bringing to them mm. like if we found hey, out that instagram tell me about tiktok uh, ads i hear this tiktok ads things new and if you didn't bring that to me first it was a bash it was a faux pas huge faux pas like you could get in trouble for that. Hmm. So I learned how to like constantly be innovative and, and like allotting time to education, which is something we carry into the company today. Say that again. That's a great, that's a great <laughs> point. How to be innovative and a lot of time for education. Like so when you say a lot of time to education, you mean stop what you're doing and learn new stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's with our team now sure. I'm like, Hey guys, 30 minutes a week, you must, I'll be tracking you. I'll be checking your time. Yeah. Like make sure you're dedicating 30 minutes a week to learning something new. You can go to HubSpot Academy. You can go to this resource. I'll pay, pay for it. Pay, I was gonna say, do you pay yeah. for it? Yeah. If, if it's something that I, that like they bring it to me and, and if it's something that I feel like is really going to help them. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Based on what I know, but, um, yeah. So like education, huge. Um, and mm. it also taught me the opposite of the things that, you know, like I hated about the agency. Like, hey, actually, maybe you should unplug. Like, don't bring your computer with you everywhere you go. Yeah. So it taught me a little bit of how to create more balance while still keeping clients happy. Sure. But I mean, I definitely, I won't lie. I'm still, I still carry a lot of the bad habits that you learn from that too. I think we all do in some stages. Um, when you have this second kid, so you're, everybody doesn't know that she's pregnant right now. When you have this second kid, it, it'll it'll shift a little bit. Kid one, I still work my face in the dirt. Yeah. Kid two was a little bit of a shift, uh, just simply because of the, sh the time restraints and things yeah. like that. Oh yeah. So it's worse. so you start to agency. Uh -huh. um, you're still in your early early twenties. Yep. Tell me about um, leading a team. Oh man, that was one thing that I'm. St I think I'm still growing. Yeah. There. Um, Great book, Extreme Ownership yeah, by Jocko, book, Jocko Willing. Yeah. I had like that's when things shifted for me. Okay. Was when I read that book and and at the time my husband, then boyfriend, was listening to a lot of Jocko, a lot mm -hmm. of leadership podcasts, yeah. stuff like that. And I was learning a lot then because I just didn't know like I had no empathy. So I my, don't have much empathy either. It's not good. It's I mean, it's like we as entrepreneurs or founders, whatever you want to call us, it, we're really good at a lot of things and like there's things we're bad at too. Like we yeah. can't we cannot own it all, we cannot do it all. And having empathy when you're, we talked about this off camera, mm -hmm. the, no one's going to care about your company as much as you. No one. And you have to, you have to harness that very early on. If you're going to start a business and hire a team, you have to know that and like practice empathy however you can, because I, one of my first hires had a kid. I, I was 25. Yeah. So I'm in this girl's like 30 and has a seven year old. And I was like, why is your kid sick all the time? Like you're always leaving to pick up your kid from school or, and I just like, the girl hates me now. <laughs> I don't nice. think, like I've tried reaching out to her. I mean, I mean, yeah. obviously it's been years, but I would love to just reach out to her or if she's hey, listening to this ever. I've got a kid now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I would have had, there, there are certain things that I look back and I'm like, no, I think I probably still would have said that thing, mm. but there's things I look back and I'm like, 
I just didn't know. I just yeah. didn't know. And it, that's, I think that's the hardest part about being a leader is like, you cannot empathize with every situation. You just can't like, no, like you have not you gone can't. through the same life experiences as them, but you can seek to understand. And so with me as a leader, like I just try and have a lot of open and honest conversations with my team. Yeah. Some of them take it a little too far. And I'm like, why are you telling me those things? <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't need some. to know that. I that some, yeah. Yeah. But others like appreciate that. Like if you're like, I talk with my employees all the time. What are your, what are your long-term aspirations? Sure. Okay. Well, you know, I want to move to the city and I think I want to work for a big agency. Okay, great. How can we help you get there? Yeah. How can I talk you out of that? Well, how can I talk you out of it? Like you're yeah. a great hard worker, but like, great. Now I kind of know in my mind sure. there's an expiration date because I can't expect you're going to be with me forever. Can't do you it. just can't like, look at my dad's a great example, mm -hmm. jumping companies and doing yeah. things that like they, he told me from a young age, like business is business. It's not personal. When you go to quit a job, like if they take it personally, that's their problem. Yeah. I'm not so like strict on that because yeah. I do think you build relationships with your team members and mm -hmm. it can hurt, it can sting. But that like that's where you gotta practice this empathy of like, okay, but they're they're their own human and they have their own goals and aspirations and yeah. like you may not fill all of those for So from eighteen to thirty, you're thirty now, one kid, one on the way, married. From 18 to 30, you've lived a lot of life. Yeah, I guess so. You really, really have. <laughs> like a lot more life than a lot more of my other guests. Tell me about the stage in life where you worked the hardest. Probably as soon as I had my sec my first. As soon as I had my first. Tell me about that. Oh, again, identity crisis. Yeah. Major identity crisis. So Jesse wasn't planned. I'll tell her that one day. Sure. <laughs> you know it's totally I mean? fine. But it was the right time. Yeah. Like it, it was the right time. It was... I couldn't see it have happened any other, any other way, and I'm so happy she's here. Yeah. Um, it was time to settle down, and it was time to stop like fooling around, for yeah. lack of a better phrase. I think I was still doing so much testing in my business, trying to figure out like, like saying yes to things, not saying no, kind yeah. of burning the candle at both ends. Right. Um, and so when I had her, it was this like, you know, you just hear like babies sleep all the time, and so I was like, okay, well, I'm not gonna get a nanny. Like I'll just work while yeah. she's sleeping. That's good. Why did no one slap me in the face and say, like, that's not going to work? Right. You're in the throes of postpartum. You're not sleeping. Yeah. Your body doesn't feel the same. Your brain doesn't react the same. You don't think the same. When the human comes out of your body, something happens to women. Okay, what anybody says, you're yeah. not the same. No, you're not. There are a lot of things that will stay the same, but you're not, you're not the same human being. No. And having a support system, obviously, with a husband and a team and all that stuff is great, but you got to make a shift, too. And, how, what, sh what was the, mo the biggest shift that you made post baby? It was realizing that I needed support and I needed to ask for help. And that was never That's something right. I was comfortable so doing. Yeah. And I'm st I still struggle with that. Yeah. You know, like my family doesn't live anywhere near us. Like my, my yeah. family's three hours away. I did that. Yep. You know, asking for help is more hiring for help. Yeah. Or when you have friends just not being afraid to ask them. And that's so, uh, that was so hard for me for to sure. just ask for help. Yeah, that's great. So <laughs> when did you have her? November 21, November of 2021. And you were 27? I was 20, I think I just 28, turned 28. 28? Yeah. Okay, what do you wish you'd have done at 25 that you didn't? Say no more to like, and, and streamline. Say no and streamline, so say, say no. Say no to what, give me an example, yeah. say no to what? I was taking projects left and right even if they didn't match our ideal client mm. or the direction of the business. I think I just saw money as money. Absolutely. But also like, I felt like I could help the people, you know, it wasn't like I wasn't doing this for greed. But you know what that makes you, it makes you normal because we <laughs> all do that when we're first starting because yeah. someone offers us dollars to do a service and we take it because we know that that's going to help us grow. Yeah. That makes you normal. But this is a great answer because someone out there is watching this and hearing this and saying, okay, I've heard a bunch of people say, you gotta say no, simply because, just because it's a dollar doesn't mean it's the right dollar. Right, and it's really wild what happens when you do say no. Mm. You know, like I've, I've always had this mindset too, like even as a kid, even being younger, I don't know where this like money mentality came. I think my, I love my parents so much. I don't yeah. think they did a great job of teaching like finances and budgeting and- No one did in the 90s and the early thousands. That's no one did. Know. That's reassuring. No one did. My parents were school teachers. They didn't have a pot to piss in or a wind to pour it out of. They didn't yeah. understand anything about money. So that's not, I think that's a, I think that's like not talking about sex in the fifties. Yeah, that's true. So that's I true. think it's just a thing that we as parents 
have to be incredibly intentional about you with do. making sure that our kids don't make stupid mistakes with money because money and sex are the two biggest things that people F up. Yeah, I know it's so true. It's so true. And there's like such a scarcity mindset around it all. But, you know, with me, it was like, okay, I always knew it was going to work out. So in college, like I remember living on like 50 bucks a week, you know, and being like, how am I going to do this? And not wanting to ask my parents for help. I was really big on that. By 22, I think my mom cut off my phone bill because there was some extra charge and it pissed her off. And I remember like having to figure out how to get to work one day mm-hmm. in crazy traffic because I didn't have directions on my phone. Mm. And so I, at that point, was like, okay, I'm paying for my own insurance and paying for my own yeah. phone. But I always knew like, even if I was getting to these, this point of like, great, I have to put that on a credit card now. That's crazy. Sure. I knew I'd always figure it out. Yeah. And so I wish that you know, I would have harnessed that a little bit more. I, at 25, I, I always knew I'd figure it out. I always knew another opportunity would come along or something mm-hmm. would come up and like, we'd be okay. Yeah. But if I had said no a little more, I might have gotten where I wanted to go a little faster. Yeah. Uh, this doesn't have to be an individual person standing in front of you, but who who's your biggest business mentor through this whole journey? Probably, I mean, my dad. Like that's, that's great. Yeah, and it's like, I didn't, I wouldn't say I talked to him all the time about it, but I think I always had the picture of my dad's success in Mm -hmm. the back of my mind. I wanted a mentor so badly. And I think I tried to seek that out in so many different ways and I never had one. So I've had people come to me and say, can you help me with this? Mentors typically don't happen when you ask for them. Mm -mm. They are typically organic. And I know that's a really, really buzzword around organic, but I think it is. It's just you make buddies with somebody and they, because I bring you along the journey. Yeah. And I think that's important, but I think when it's forced, it's incredibly difficult. Yeah. I would see my, like my mentors today are like, I do a, I do a lot of networking, a lot of coffee chats, a lot of like virtual phone calls, meet someone in an industry who maybe has a similar ideal client. There's some overlap huh. in what we do. And I get on those people, I get on I probably two or three people a month. I get on a call with them once a month and we kind of just talk like what's going on in the industry and and they have things they can teach me. I have things they I teach them. And those are those are my mentors. These Where days. do you meet those people? Uh, different like networking groups. What it, g- give me an example because this is great information. Yeah, one so one for females. One's called Entrepreneurista, and I've that I mean, sounds one, so fancy. It's it's not, <laughs> but say, it's cute. I love it. It's not like fancy <laughs> fancy, but what's it called? They've nailed it, Entrepreneurista. Okay. And it's an online community. They run their platform on something called Circle. You might have heard of it. Yeah. Um, I met one girl in there who had spider webbed a ton of connections. She's like, you need to know this person. It just takes one person. No, that's it. It just takes one person who knows people who like can connect you and just say like, I think you'd have a lot of synergies with this person. And so that opened a lot of doors for me in like probably the last five or six months. I, this is, let me tell you something right now. I love doing that. I did it twice yesterday. Networking? No, just talking to somebody and then hearing them say something and saying, okay, Jake, one of the first guests on my podcast, Jake Elkins, owns a Mac Daddy awesome wrestling club in Birmingham. Okay. One of the best in the Southeast. He trains kids, but he also trains um, coaches, and he also trains Olympic athletes. I mean, he's a stud, okay, in wrestling. Not like WWF, but right. like, you know. So, and then, but a buddy of his, a buddy of another buddy of mine, owns a basketball gym where they do the same thing. Okay. It's the same thought. Yeah. And I said, dude, you got to meet this guy. You got to know each other. And I, we connected him. And then last night, I'm talking to a friend of mine who owns a business who was a, who was kind of a mentor of mine when I first started MillFit, and he does security systems for retirement homes and assisted living. Last week, I talked to a guy that used to work for me who is consulting for a guy that has a conglomerate of assisted living and retirement homes. And like, I'm like, dude, you gotta meet, you gotta meet so and so. Because There's so much power in that because those people are so grateful and thankful for those connections and it yes. com- comes back to you. Yes. And so I love, I enjoy doing that as much as I do anything Yeah. because I don't know. It's a, it's, I think it's a form of giving It is. that I just, I just love doing that. I like, I like doing that as much as I'd like, like making a deal Yeah. because I know that it's going to help that person do that. Right. It's, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we all as founders, entrepreneurs, whatever, come out here to do our thing and like get the freedom that we want. Sure. You typically you don't start your business because you think it's a good idea. Like there's something that it's going to give you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm not going to get anything about the <clears throat> security business. Yeah. 
Right, but you, like, it's greater good. You're helping yeah, them. You're absolutely. helping them with their dreams and aspirations. Sure. Okay, we're on the elevator. You and I are on the elevator. And I look at you and I go, hey, what's your name? And you say, hey, my name's Lauren. I say, hey, what do you do? Give me the elevator version of what you do. The elevator version of what I do. So I own a marketing agency. I'm also a podcast host and have a real estate business on the side with my husband. And um, in our marketing business, I we really help brands who are in this like growth stage startup start to scale make more money, reach more people. What is the most common mistake that business owners make in marketing? The most common mistake is thinking they need to be everywhere all at once and not Explain. like, Explain. you got to keep marketing simple. Okay. Know your ideal audience. Yep. That is like apps. That's number one. You got to sure. know who they are, what they do, characteristics, pers personify mm -hmm. the crap out of them yep. and then reach them on the channels they're at. Start there. That's the biggest mistake I see is that they they just think they need to be on all the channels all the time and the messaging is not targeted whatsoever. You're kind of speaking to everyone while speaking to no one at the same time. Reach them on the channels where they are. Yeah. So if you've got you know high level business executives, you don't need to be on TikTok. No, you need to be on LinkedIn. Gotcha. <laughs> I love that. Um, so marketing agency, real estate, podcast. Tell me about your podcast. I, yeah, so I started my podcast it's called She's Busy AF. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I started it right before I got pregnant, so manifested that. Um, and I started it because there was this, you, when, you say, when, you, when you go to see a friend and, and you say to them, how are you doing? And they're like, I'm busy. I'm so busy. Yeah, and I'm like, it's kind of funny, you know? Like, I say it, I, and, yeah. I, and then I also make fun of people who say it. Sure. And so it's like, okay, you're busy, but what does that mean? And like, how do we not be, it's just, it's like a big theme for like, how do you it's channel a, that? It's almost a badge though, Lauren. Yeah. It's almost a badge. And that's the hard part is like, I try to avoid saying it no matter how crazy we are. I try to avoid saying it because I don't want to be like, I'm just so busy. You know what? I'm really not that busy. Like Saturday, I'm, I'm nuts. Like Saturday, we got volleyball all day, basketball yeah, and life. wrestling. Like I'll go from eight and probably be done at 10. No big deal. But other than that, I tell people this all the time, and you can probably do this because you're a business owner. They look at you and they go, I know you're so busy. And I go, yeah, I got things to do, but if you need something, I can always plan it out and do whatever you need me to do. It's what's important. You're, you're focusing on what's important. Absolutely. And that's like, that's the theme of the podcast is like, let's that's focus good. on what's important. And I talk about, I mean, there's, if you go way back, like, I think I talk about the wedding and one, like my, my wedding in mm -hmm. one episode, like. It's just kind of about the life, but there's a lot. I bring on a lot of strategic guests too for, you know, how to grow your business, how to scale. Like, is it all marketing. women? No, I've had some dudes on. Okay. Yeah. Any good? Yeah. The, I had um, a guy named Kyle Gray on. Okay. Storytelling expert. If you want to, if, if keynote speaking is something you want to do, go listen to that episode. Really? Mm hmm. Real estate. Real estate. So talked about your marketing stuff. Talked about your podcast. She's busy as AF. Is that right? She's busy AF. She's busy AF. Yeah. Okay. Um, Real estate. We talked about this off camera. Mm -hmm. Short term rental. Yeah. So I'm going to back up for a quick second. Yeah. Remember how we talked about college and how like yeah. I, my husband and I sat down and we said, do we want to force our kids to go to school? Mm. It, this day and age, like, I don't know what's going to happen 10, 20 years from now, but like college is <clears throat> a weird place now. There's so much politics involved. It's so expensive. The model is like get in debt basically. And I'm like, but the model's very old too. The model's very old. The so model's very old. I'm hoping it shifts. Sure. But at the same time, if my kid says I want to be a pilot or I want to be a hairdresser, yeah. what is my college fund going to do for them? No doubt. So we were like, let's just do, um, what, we'll just do like retirement accounts basically. So mm. that's what we have set up. We have one set up for Jesse. We'll set one up for the next kid, um, instead of a college fund. So, okay. So go back. I mean, I'm going to get in the, in the weeds with you a little bit. Yeah. So why do you have a, a retirement fund? for a kid that's going to be 18 years old and need or want money to go do something. I guess maybe that, that's the wrong word. It, it's like the IRA or whatever. It's like a, it's, um, what are they called? The investment accounts. Okay. It's an investment accounts. account. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. <clears throat> yeah. There's a major difference in a yeah, retirement sorry. account. So it's not a retirement account. It's an investment account. Perfect. I used the wrong word. I'm you sorry. You did. You did. Well, you, you confused me. I'm like, Oh my no. God, we got to stop the camera no. and talk about this. Cause this no. is not right. I did the wrong thing. Yeah. No, no, okay. no, no. So it's so a brokerage it's, account. So yes. we do the same thing. Yeah. I you think just, it's brilliant. You just put money in it every month? Every quarter we drop, quarter. yeah, yeah. Every quarter our, our financial dude like drops whatever, takes a bunch okay. of money from our account. And it's great because then when she turns 18, it's like, all right, here. So, so that's one piece of it, right? That's you great. asked about real estate yeah. and I'm like, that's a piece of it. The other piece is 
real estate is just an incredible asset to have and our our plans are have like as not as many homes if not more as we have kids and like when you graduate college or graduate high school and like if you want to join the business or take one of the homes like either live in it or sell it and do what you want with that money you know like but that. like just putting the the freedom and the choice in there like i just i think if like if i had that i don't know what i would have done i probably still would have gone to school yeah but then i i would have maybe not have struggled so much or maybe have gone and moved to a city where i could have gotten maybe the more of the experience i really wanted mm -hmm. you know i don't know it just like it opens money opens a lot of doors for you when you're young to figure mm -hmm. things out with proper guidance um and so we just don't want to silo our kids into having to go to college or having to use a fund for college if they yeah. don't want to you do short-term rental right yeah we have well we have one one property that has tenants in it one that has short-term rental and that's we kind of like both yeah it just depends. Yeah, I mean, interest rates, I mean, we can so, go to that. So like, you, the word short-term rental is foreign to some people. The What everybody says these days is Airbnb. Yeah. It's not Airbnb, it's short-term rental. Airbnb yeah. is kind of like a Band-Aid. It's not a Band-Aid, it's called a bandage. It's, it's a, a manager exactly, of a short-term rental. Exactly, yeah. There, yeah. So you've got those two. So one of them is like a, a renter, like a long-term rental. Yeah. you got long-term, which is Johnny and Susie live there, and that's their, their house. you got short-term, which is Johnny and Susie, pop into Miami for four days and they stay in your Airbnb or your short-term rental. They are two highly different properties. Totally <clears throat> different properties. But then you have the new thing is midterm. Midterm. Have you heard of that and kind of went down that well, rabbit hole? Well, um, our houses are in Florida and okay. we have seasonal renters. So is yeah. that what you're talking about? No, midterm rental is the CEO <coughs> of Hard Rock has to, is lives in Dallas and he has to go to Florida has to start next week. Okay, yeah. And yeah. but but he's got Lauren and the family in Dallas, and they got to go to Orlando. So he's gonna go rent a house for four months. That's so common these days. Yeah. Okay, that is midterm. So it's a it's kind of a bastard child of short term rental and normal long term rental. Travel nurses. Um, oh, like furnish finder. Exec executives. Yes. Yeah. It is a thriving business right now and it's higher than short-term rental as far as the, the excuse me it's um higher um occupancy rates than short-term rental not as much money as short-term rental but bigger money than long-term rental yeah it's kind of a sweet spot there it is a sweet spot. you also have to furnish it too which is kind yeah. of a hang-up for some people financially i think we had to scramble with our long-term property yeah we tried to make it an airbnb and that's why i said they're two very different properties one is like interior design to the nines yeah, yeah. tiki hut painted oh, pool yeah. deck heated pool yeah wallpaper that's the short term epic yeah short term and Kill that it. thing 82 percent occupancy 82 yeah. all year long yeah that's incredible it's crazy what about your long term did you so how did why did you transition it to just couldn't get it rented it took we, we launched it and it was the opposite we launched the other property and that night i had 10 bookings <sighs> we launched the the one that was our former home and cute you know yeah but central five minutes from the airport five minutes from downtown five minutes from beach five minutes from convention center thinking that would be enough uh -uh. we didn't have a pool we didn't mm. have really like any amenities it was just a nice home it's cool but is it great Two for weeks. long term it's great for long term it's great for long term we got tenants in there at a really good rate wow so we didn't have time i think if that if the tenants decide not to renew we might look into midterm midterm's great because it's I, also on the water like you can put a boat there like the, oh it's on the water yeah, it's a, it's oh on God. a it's on a canal that's incredible. in Port Lauderdale. Yeah, it's it's kind of, that's why it blew our minds yeah. that like we couldn't get it up and running on short term. But I mean that's, that's if it works, it works. If it's paying the mortgage and making a little extra money, it's great. Yes, perfect. So you've got three different things going. You got the podcast, you got your business, you've got um, the rental, the market, real estate stuff. What do you really what are you spending most of your time on this year? This year, probably more real estate. I'm trying to get okay. my license now. Really. Yeah, because I think if if we're going to keep buying and selling, I want to transact. I want to keep the money. I'm cheap. <laughs> Is it worth it, though? I mean, you, you, don't, you can't answer the question. I, I, I have a, my mom's a real estate broker, and yeah. I have a lot of real estate friends. And so if I hang my license locally and refer business, like, yeah, extra cash in the pocket. Sure. I get that's that. worth it. Yep. Um, and, yeah, to, like, have the license and be able to transact also, like again, my mom's my mom's. So that's something we totally glazed yeah. over. But my mom got her broker's license. Like my mom 
when I was in high school, started to go into real estate, and that's how she paid. My, she paid for my college with her with real, real estate, estate license. Good yeah, for her. That was her goal. Um, and so I kind of have that background, that know how, and I've worked with a lot of real estate clients. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. I think I think it would also help like what I do in business. Now, transitioning to that, how have you been able to not focus on the business part of team. it? Team. Okay. Building a team. What's your What's your most important hire at a marketing agency? Talent that can do the work. So yeah. like the implement, the, pe the people, it's like the, I don't want to call them the entry level people, but they're the people at the proverbial bottom. Right. What, um, so your marketing, it's what you do. What social platforms do you get the most business out of? Instagram and LinkedIn. People seeing your stuff and DMing you and say, I, I need help. Or what does that look like? Well, from a social platform point of view, yeah, it's it's the relationship building that happens on those platforms. Mm. So it's not just posting content; it's engaging. You gotta engage. Like you okay. gotta be, you gotta have a presence on the platform. You gotta outwardly engage. You gotta build the relationships. Yeah. Yeah, but we also um, are affiliates of a lot of the software we use, and that sends us a lot of business too. Oh. <clears throat> We've also created affiliate partnerships with like big deal past clients. Okay. Which has done a lot for us too. Huge. Are you a reader? Oh yeah. Okay. This is my new cool question. Okay. If you had two books on your desk that every time somebody walked in the door, you gave them a copy of one or the other, what would those two books be? Built to Sell. Okay, great. Love it. And Extreme Ownership. I have to bring that up really? again. Yeah. I mean, I, I love war stories. I'm a weirdo yeah. like that. And I think it's so cool that Jocko, like, Jocko and Leif like, intertwined war stories with yeah. business practices. And I just think Extreme Ownership is like the standard. Yeah. It's not a new concept, but the way that they explain it and the way that they teach it will help you be the best leader and not screw up so much in business. Have you listened to that book? Listened to it? I haven't listened to it. I read the book. Listen. You think it's a good audio book? I know it's a good audio book because that's what I did to it. I listened to it. I, I mean, I like listening to Jocko. Is that his first one or his second one? I... There were two of them that were very similar. No, yeah, I think it's his first one because there's one okay. right after and then he has like leadership tactics. The first... Okay, that's the one you need to listen to. For extreme ownership? Okay. Because he goes through the war stuff. Oh man. You know how he gives the examples in the book? He does the same thing, but it's like. Way he, more intense. Oh my God. And yeah. he's doing it. And then there's another voice doing it. Like, it's incredible. That's, the, that's, how I, that's why right. I like the book so much because it was just like engaging, extremely engaging the whole time. I have a really, I will, I'm not going to lie, I have a really hard time with business books because of, like, I, I have to listen to them or I, I don't know. It's like. I agree with that. Business books and business podcasts are typically really challenging for me. I need the storytelling component, which is why I love Built to Sell. Yes. Because Built to Sell is like, it's it's not a very good story. You know, at the end no, of it, it's, it's not like... No, it's a bad story, but he tells it and it, it's applicable. Yes. And you can, it's extremely simple. And, and so it's that's short. Why it, you rip through so, it. Yeah, so that's why it is. So what's your favorite podcast that you listen to? Or do you? <clears throat> business or personal? <laughs> uh, let's do business. What's your favorite business podcast? My favorite business podcast is probably my first million. Yes! Oh my gosh! So it is it's my just, favorite. It is so good. It's so fun. It is it's, fun. I listened to what they did, how I got my first 100 customers or something. Yes. That one like recently. And that was, I'm like, oh my God, I'm learning so much. Yeah. The thing is, it's not applicable to every, like, it's not niche. You know, they talk about product, they talk about, like, it's, Yo. so you got to be yeah. like, but I do think it's good to be well-rounded and have the, have the overview of like, D to C, B to B, B to C. Hearing them talk about all the different things, though, it makes you want to stop and Google the term or Google whatever. And like even you know. Sam, Sam's the world's worst. It like saying, I don't know what this means. And he's like looking stuff up on, on the on the show. So like yeah. it is absolutely my favorite. Have you listened to the one with uh, Sean and Tony Robbins yet? No, I haven't. It was like three or four days ago. It was very, very good. Okay. Very, very good. And I haven't missed one in, I don't know, probably a year. So that's that's a good podcast. That's a good podcast. Jocko's debrief episodes are also really good. Okay, I've yeah. never heard of that. Yeah, I don't he, listen to him. His stuff can get really deep and dark and heavy, but the debriefs are cool because you know how he has his like leadership business. Yeah, and he goes, he gets hired to go in and basically like extreme ownership eyes the whole business. Correct. The debriefs are like the takeaways from. So when they go debrief, into the debrief podcast. No, it's his podcast, but you got to look for the episodes that say like debrief. 
debrief colon and then like it'll be you know a certain topic okay. i'll poke in and, out, and those are short because you know most of those episodes are like three hours yeah but those are short they're like 45 minutes and it's a con it's usually like a concept something that's like yeah wow this was like really prevalent for this company and it might be i like my first million because it's business mm -hmm. and the guy that's who's the british guy diary of a ceo i don't know i'm really bad with names okay Steven is his first name. He has so many different clients on there that they're talking about sex one time. They're talking about, you know, hot psychedelics the next time. Yeah. And I like, hey, this is what we're going to get. Yeah. That's why I think that's why I like it so much. All right, yeah. personal podcast. What's your favorite personal podcast? Uh, this is like really silly. It's okay. But it's the toast. It's a millennial morning show and they go through fast five stories, which are like, Celebrity gossip, basically, totally and I'm fine. a big Swifty. Like, are you really? I'm, I'm not even shy That's about fine. it. It's totally fine. Listen, like, I've listened to Taylor Swift's since debut album, so Perfect. like, I'm like an OG Swifty. That's so, that's so good. And they are huge Swifties, and yeah. so it's like one of the stories is always about Taylor Swift. I'm like, I need to know what's going, I need on. To know what's going on. I also don't watch the Oscars, the Emmys, or any of those things, and so mm -hmm. just to get it like a quick recap from someone else. Yeah. It's they do it. It's a daily show, so mm -hmm. it's like I listen to it. I'm getting ready or going to pick up my kid from school, and it's just a way to it's like mindless. Disconnect. That's great. Yeah. Who's your favorite person online that you've learned the most from? Currently, yeah. Well, okay. It's a girl. Her name is Melissa Lower. She's no one like really notable. She owns Waverly Ave Consulting. She is the person who's connected me to so many people lately. What is her name? Melissa Lohrer. I'm going to say her name so wrong. It's L-O-H-R-E-R. -E Waverly Consulting. She is a business development coach for agencies. Okay. Super niche. Super niche, but this girl's content, follow her on LinkedIn and Instagram. Like, I, that's a hard question for me to answer when no, you say correct. that because. You knew the answer though. But, but everyone says the same thing in this vacuum of social media and this girl doesn't. Huh. So it speaks to me because I'm like, never would have thought of that. And I've been in this agency space a long time. Would she be applicable for someone like me that's not in the agency space? If you're, uh, if you do anything B2B. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, she's very big on like relationships, networking, you know, not buying leads. Cool. It's like business development and growth. Yeah. yeah. Like totally. She's awesome. She's, she's, she's like, That's great. Dead, I will start agency. following her now. You should. You knew that, you knew that, you knew that name pretty quickly. She's in the front of my mind. Um, so tell me how, how have you changed the most this past year? How have I changed the most? Probably emotionally in a professional sense so like how I interact with team and use and drive team to drive growth that's I've learned and grown the most there that's got to be a true answer because I asked you what you're working on this year and you said real estate which is not your primary business yeah so that tells me that you're not having to spend x number of hours a day a week on the quote unquote business that's, I would imagine probably is the one paying your bills. You, you don't even want to know how much time I spent in the last eight months on team development and yeah. team management. And like, it's really when you, when you are, if you're a business owner and you start to grow a team, be prepared to like shift out of the seat of doing the thing you think you love the most. And then, and now being like a people manager. How hard is it to play the game of managing the humans and letting them do their own thing. I'm str I'm not struggling with it, but like, if something anywhere remotely goes off the rails, I go, Kah! I should have been involved in that. So how hard is that to manage those two things? It's really, yeah. <laughs> really hard. Like I, I can't say it gets easier other than the time investment you put in your people. So it really goes all the way back to like, make the right hire you know, like spend four weeks vetting someone before you hire them, like take your time in the hiring process mm -hmm. to make sure it is the right fit. Yeah. Because once they get in, like skill sets, one thing, but culture is another. And you really should like, you really should be hiring for culture and for personality yeah. with, uh, cause you can, you can grow skill set. You can grow skill set. Sure. I've made those hires and, and they've worked out well. It may take a little bit more time, mm -hmm. but no, it's, it's really hard. <laughs> it's, and there's no sugar coating that. No. But I, what I found to help is like a lot of touch points, a lot of, especially we're a completely remote team, which makes it even harder. Yeah. And so a lot of touch points, a lot of 
making them feel safe and comfortable to come to you when they have questions, concerns, or feedback, um, and empowering them too. So about it's really all about creating entrepreneurial situations sure. so that they can problem solve on their own. What are the two or three habits you're not going to get rid of? Habits. Time blocking. Okay. Yeah. Like saving my Mondays, like no client meetings and Great. being very hard in that boundary. That's good. That's a huge habit. Um, sleep. Okay. Yeah. Um, I used to like not care about sleep, stay up late, whatever. Sleep is so important. Okay. You know, like I'll put my kid down at 730 and maybe go to bed shortly after. Absolutely. Um, so those are, th those are the two I can think of. I, I want to sit here and tell you daily movement. Mm. That's been so hard for me. Yeah. It's so hard. Oh. That's, that's one that like, I want to have daily movement. I walk every day at a minimum. Yeah. You know, that's good. And water and water, <laughs> lots of water. Um, last two questions. What is your favorite vacation that you've ever taken? Favorite vacation I've ever taken. Probably Yosemite. Really? I'm a national park girly. Oh, okay. Wait, no, wait, let me back up. Sedona, Arizona. Okay. So Arizona. Yeah. So I did like Sedona, Grand Canyon. That was like, you feel like you're on Mars, first of all. And secondly, it's like, you just, it, the West Coast of the U.S. puts in perspective, like the true beauty of the United States. It it's, really is. It's incredible. Have you, what have you done in the Grand Canyon? Have you done? South, I, I didn't, we did like um, South Kebab Trail at, okay. um, at South Rim. We did rim, uh, rim to Rim. Oh my gosh. Two years ago. See, okay, so you know, I started having kids at 28. If yeah. I had two or three more years, I, I would have done more national parks, more hiking. So here's one of my rites of passage. My, I've, my oldest is 15. When she graduates or her senior year, we are going to do rim to rim. That's awesome. We're going to train for it. Because here's the thing. It's intense. You, you've got to train for it. Yeah. You have to train for it. And so that's one of the things that we're going to do. Um, we'll talk about that more later. That's great. What is your favorite vacation that you've never taken? That I've never taken, meaning like what, a place I want to go. Mm -hmm. That's that's a really funny way to frame that. Oh man, probably Australia or New Zealand. Okay. Yeah. My best friend's been in New Zealand. Spent twelve days there. He said it was the best trip he's ever taken. Yeah, they, I, I like, they, I'm a they, nature. They did it now. They did it. I mean, bungee jumping off of bridges. Oh and my gosh, that's so soccer cool. Soccer games and and like they 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 did it. It's a totally different, it's a different world, literally. It really is. Like different world. And I love nature. So like, yeah. I don't, like I've done all the cities. I've done the like European cities, sure. but like the untapped nature of it all. I just think like that's what, that's when you're sitting behind a desk every day, that's what you don't get. Yep. Oh, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, you've been so much fun. I've learned a lot. And also, um, I feel like we're probably very like-minded in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know you that well, but I feel like I know you a lot better now. So where can someone find you if they want to do business with you, ask you questions? I, I don't know. Where, where can someone find you? LinkedIn. LinkedIn's my, okay. my hangout spot. So just Lauren Loretto on LinkedIn. If you want to check out what Brand Good Time does, because it's a lot of fun over there, brandgoodtime.com or Instagram at Brand Good Time. Wonderful. Hey, thank you so much. It's been great. Thanks for having me, Thomas. Bye.